Did it land? Good evening from Calvary Chapel Saving Grace. Um, happy to be able to uh, be with you tonight. And uh, uh, we are in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, we are, of course, scheduling any Lee's live stream uh, broadcast. Uh, we'll have another one on Sunday, April 19th at 9 a.m. And another one next Wednesday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. We're on YouTube. Just search Calvary Chapel Saving Grace Mesa. And uh, also, uh, we know that there are needs out there. We know that uh, there may be some things that you can use some help with. Maybe it's just a some comfort, maybe it's just a, a voice to talk to, maybe it's, it's just some, some counsel. Uh, just, just wanting to know what's going on, please do not hesitate to give us a call. And if you need someone to go to the store for you particularly, uh, call 480-678-7662, the number that's on your screen. And we are praying for you. Believe me, we, we are praying for you continually and we are looking forward to the day that we can see you all and in person. And uh, with that, uh, let's uh, go to uh, our scripture. Uh, I would like to start off in Psalms and go to Psalm 143. As I was studying, this was the psalm that came to my heart, and so I wanted to share it with you. Psalm 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness, answer me. And in your righteousness, do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight, no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have been long dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of righteousness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring me my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul for I am your servant. So as, uh, as I said, we are in Exodus chapter 20, and we have been covering the Decalogue, the 10 words, the 10 commandments. And of course, God is speaking to the children of Israel from the mountain, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. And he's not speaking to them gently. He's speaking to them with fire, with thunder, with the sound of the shofar hearing to really get their attention. And he's covering them and talking to them and giving them his commands. And starting in verse one again, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. He's telling them what he's done. He's brought them out of the house of bondage. All these things he has done, establishing who has done these things, who has brought them to where they are. This is not something that was done by any one of them. It wasn't done by Moses. It was done by the Lord God. He's freed them. And of course, he's not mentioning the manna. 
He's not mentioning the quail. He's not mentioning that they, they would not even eat. They wouldn't have water if it were not for his provision, his mighty provision. So he's brought them there. He's done this, and he is now establishing his authority. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. There's the first tablet the first five words, the first five of the Decalogue. Interesting that he put honor your father and your mother together with authority of who he is and what you are to do, what, what he wanted the children of Israel to do, to know who he is, to establish his authority, to give these commandments, to tell them what the way they were to live, rather. So the first four, as we've discussed really, are vertical. God to us, us to God. Now, with honor your father and your mother, he starts the horizontal. How we are to behave toward each other. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And now, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We know this. We know this commandment really well. A lot of it, a lot of it's translated, you shall not lie. There's so much scripture that relates to the telling of the truth that we could be here for hours and still not cover it all. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. These things, these six things, excuse me, the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. We all know that we're not supposed to lie. Uh, we, we teach it to our children, we learn it in school, uh, we, of course, read it in the Decalogue, we've learned it for a long time. And yet our culture is imbued with it. 
We've built up a, a, a nation, practically, that's, that's built on lies. Even our history, you have to look deep to see, and sometimes that it um, was written for, by self-serving people, self-serving men, women, mostly men. A lot of our history um, has been fabricated. It's terrible, I know. I, I studied it. Uh, when I was a, a child, George Armstrong Custer was a hero. I mean, he was a hero who went down fighting against overwhelming odds. It wasn't quite like that. He was rather foolish. Uh, he wasn't quite the villain that people make him out to be, but he was certainly no hero. And the Sioux and Cheyenne, the Lakota, who fought with him on that day, on that June 26th, weren't villains. They, they were fighting for what, their lands. They were, they were fighting an enemy who would invaded their dinner hour, actually. Um, so you learn certain things as you, as you get older, as you study, as you look through, through and dig deep. You start learning truth. But truth is important. Truth is extremely important. Why, why is God saying this? Why is God saying, thou shalt not bear false witness? Because he's speaking of himself, because he's a God of truth. In Exodus 20, 16, from this command, we know God's attribute of truthfulness, because it is impossible for God to lie. God is a God of truth, all truth. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and believe me, we can go into a lot of scripture on this, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of an eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. God is giving us his characteristic. He deals in truth. You shall not bear false witness, calls to mind a courtroom. where the concept of law, the concept of truth is basic, it's fundamental. Without this, we're in serious, serious trouble. But it's interesting in terms of how we think of the truth because when it comes to lying, when it comes to embellishing, we all do it. We do. There isn't one of us if we're called to account, who can't say, well, I've never lied, or I, I tell the truth up absolutely all the time, et cetera, et cetera. We have an interesting concept of lying. Man's concept of lying is if I lie, it's justifiable. If I lie, it's okay, because I, I have these circumstances and so on and so forth, but if you lie, if you lie to me, that's unforgivable. Isn't that interesting? But it usually works out that way. I, I can basically kind of twist the truth a little bit, but don't you do that to me. As a matter of fact, we see that. We see that in, in courtrooms. We see that uh, in government. It, it, the government will tell you, don't lie to me. We, they may, a politician may lie to you, but don't lie to the politician. Don't lie to the government. Whoa, woe betide you. Why not the truth all the time? We've, we've really built a society that's almost built on lies. We're going to get into some of that. The word lying in Hebrew is shikr. Shikr. That which is false, untrue, untruthfulness, deception, misrepresentation, or exaggeration. It's pretty specific. It's pretty specific. In John 8, verses 31 to 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Our God is a God of truth. Jesus is truth. 
Why do we hide from it? Why do we run from it so often? We, we basically tell ourselves we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We basically tell people, um, you know, you're, you're too, too brutal, you're too honest. And it, don't get me wrong, honesty does not mean you have to be unkind. But we certainly make a, a skill at how we can weave the truth so that it hardly comes out sounding like the truth. We don't, again, want to hurt anybody's feelings. Even though in John 8, 31, the Lord says, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And there we are. We should be free. But the ninth commandment isn't just you shall not lie. It's a lot more explicit than that. Because it, it calls for witnesses summoned to testify in court to tell the truth. That's the basics of it, the basis of it, rather. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because a false witness, someone who purges themselves in court, uses it, uses a lie like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Proverbs 25, 18. It's the slide before. You're on the, you're on the there you go. So someone who lies in court uses the state, uses the power of the state as a weapon against the person who they're lying against. We speak truth of and to our neighbors because they're made in God's image. To bear false witness is blasphemy against another human as bearing God's name, lightly as blasphemy against him. So just as, as if we, when we casually use God's name, we're blaspheming God. When we lie, we're blaspheming against the person that we're talking to. Bearing false witness calls to mind, actually, bringing something that's untrue. You're bearing something, giving something that's untrue to another. Communication is a two-way street. It, it, it says something that's going forward and to someone else and something that's coming back to us. It's going back and forth. If we're bearing false, if we're bearing false witness, we are presenting an untruth. We're bearing ourselves as untrue. We're not presenting ourselves in truth. It's, it sounds basic, but again, we do it all the time. When you bear false witness, when some people look at the ninth commandment, they think of just a courtroom. And indeed, we should think of a courtroom because that's what it brings to mind. That's the first instance that God wants us to think about. The truth coming into his court in truth. Our courtrooms, if you'll notice, you, usually you'll go into where there is a courtroom and you'll have a statue of justice. And you'll notice that the statue is, is blinded. She is blind and she's holding scales. She's not looking at people. She's not looking at, at anything. But she's weighing the truth against falsehood. That's what a court does. If you lie there, if you misrepresent yourself there, if we do that routinely, then our entire justice system gets perverted. If we do that when we create laws, if we do that if, as, as we just wake up and live our lives, we're fabricating falsehoods. And we've got a society that's saying that's pretty much okay. As a matter of fact, we've got politicians that will tell you, well, I mean, heck, they're politicians. Come on, you can't trust that. What politician can get elected telling the truth? What politician can stand there, really, and tell the, the total truth to a crowd and say, hey, this is the way it really is, this is what we have to do, this is what we have to face, and so on and so forth and get elected. Uh, sorry, but I, I don't see very many of them doing that, do you? As a matter of fact, they, the very word politician denotes that you can't trust them. Isn't that sad? 
It wasn't the way it was designed. Our rulers were not to be liars or, or people who with, constantly withhold the truth. But the scriptures show bearing false witness also means more than just lying against someone in court. Bearing false witness means any kind of lying. Any kind of lying. Proverbs 19, 5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. This is serious stuff to our Lord. This is very, very serious. And yet, we do it so casually. And we do it again because, oh, my heavens. I was working in a company and we were coming up with a new product. And actually, it wasn't a bad product. And in a meeting, the president of this particular company had decided that they can embellish, they could say things that did not prove out in testing the product. And I remember speaking up. I, I raised my hand at the meeting and I said, well now, why do we need to do this? Uh, the product is pretty good. I mean, it, 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 why don't we just talk about its merits? Why are we talking and trying to embellish and say things that it, the product doesn't really do? This was the response I got. The president looked at me and then looked around the room and he said, we're all adults here. Did you get that? We're all adults here. We're all grown-ups, we're not kids. Come on. Think about that. Because we're adults, I suppose, we can lie, we can embellish. How many of you have heard that term? Well, we're all adults here to justify whatever. We're all adults. We can lie. We can present ourselves as something that we're not. We can present this product as something that it isn't. It's perfectly okay. Hey, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It's all right. Uh, there's a film I saw that I enjoyed. And it's a historical film, even though it's not totally, like most films, are not, not very accurate. It's called Lawrence of Arabia. And in this particular film, Lawrence, who's been on a mission to get the Arabian tribes on his side, particularly Prince Faisal, finds out that the British and the French have signed an agreement called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which is at the end of World War I, France and England are going to split up Saudi Arabia, Jordan, what turned into Jordan, and so on and so forth, amongst themselves in, in authority. Now, this is a direct lie, direct, uh, excuse me, totally contravening what they were telling the tribes who were fighting the Turks on the side of the British and the French. So Lawrence now learns this from his commanding officer, and he also has his mentor, uh, Mr. Dryden, who's the political officer there. And Lawrence's reaction when he learns of this treaty is to say there might, may be honor among thieves, but there's none among politicians, which is a direct slap at his mentor. And his mentor looks at Lawrence and he says the following, When a man lies, he hides the truth. But you, you lie to yourself. When a man lies, he, li he hides the truth. But when a man lies to himself, he's forgotten where he put it. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that line. When a man lies, he's forgotten where he's put the truth. It's bad enough to lie, but when you forget what truth is, 
Sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm concerned that we have forgotten what truth is. We don't want the truth. I've worked with enough companies where when you bring truth, you're called a wet blanket. You're trying to dim enthusiasm. When you basically call it for what it is and say, hey, this may not work. This may not work out the way you want to. This is, or look, this information tells me the following, that we really have some serious, serious issues, some serious problems. You are a wet blanket. You're a wet blanket. No, 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 no. Well, the ninth commandment demands truth-telling in every setting, not just under the formal procedures of a court of law. It prohibits betrayal. It, pro it prohibits you from betraying. It prohibits slander. It prohibits the spreading of evil rumors, gossip. That's all part of bearing false witness. All of it. When you are with people who are telling you not to tell the truth, or you're working with a company that's saying don't tell the truth, or any situation that says don't tell the truth, if you're forbidden to tell the truth, and you're forbidden to name problems, we can't identify real evils. You can't really see what's going on. We cannot propose solutions. You're not really able to see just what the real problem is because everybody's lying about it or nobody wants to expose it. Nobody wants to shed light. Nobody wants to tell what's really happening. The story of the emperor's new clothes. The child who finally is seeing the emperor parading naked and says, oh, look, the emperor, the emperor's naked, finally calls it. Finally calls it. Everybody else was going along with the emperor. But what was the truth? He had nothing. How can we propose any solutions when we won't admit what the problem is? when we don't even want to hear the word problem, we don't want to use the word problem. It's a negative. It's a negative. I've, I've read in these studies about tribes who, who basically w actually work themselves into lying all the time because the deities that they believe in will will catch them or do something terrible to them if they know what the truth is. There was a, a show that I love. Uh, I go to the movie simply because there were some good examples. Uh, one of them was called The Good Earth. And here you have a farmer who married this, this young woman who took her out of a rich, rich household where she was a servant, where no one wanted her. Well, he wound up with her. She was his wife. And they had a child. And they bring the child to this big house to show off the child to this woman's former master. And as they leave the house, they start talking. The husband starts talking about how beautiful the child is and how lucky they are and how the harvest has been great and how everything's going. And the wife takes him and shakes him a little bit and says, like, what are you doing? And he stops and he looks up and he went, oh, 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 the, the harvest was so terrible. The harvest, and our child, and she says, oh, our child is so ugly. Our child is just so ugly. And oh, yeah, and you stop and think about what's going on here, that they are talking to their ancestors and they're lying to their ancestors because they don't want their ancestors angry because they're prospering. There are other cultures that are like that. There are people who live their lives that way. No, 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 we don't want to say because that's going to bring bad luck. If I tell you that I've had good fortune, I have, that's, bring, that's jinxing me. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? God speaking from the top of the mountain to his children, to this nation that he's He's created. 
doesn't want them to be that way. Does not want them to lie. Does not want them to bear false witness. Does not want them to do that. Because when you do that, as we have discussed last week, when you break one commandment, you break them all. But who are we serving? Who are we serving when we lie? What's the source? Consider what the source is. In John 8, 44, you are of your father. This is our Lord speaking, remember, to the Pharisees who had been trying to entrap him, to ensnare him with all his questions. And they said, well, we're of Abraham. And he said, no, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. God is the source of truth. Note that scripture declares over and over and over again that God is the God of truth. And we'll look at some of them. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us in Hebrews 6, 17 to 18. Aren't we glad that our God is a God of truth? Think of where we would be if our God was not a God of truth. Think of where we would be if we could not trust his word to us. If we could not believe what he has told us over and over again, the promises that he has made to us, the promises that he has made to Israel, which still stand, where would we be if God was like us? Now, what about our enemies? Are we free to give them false testimony? Is it okay to lie to our enemies? Hmm? Some of you may say, well, I, I've read about some lies in, in, in Scripture, and yeah, and Scripture's heroes uh, deceive our, our, their enemies uh, from time to time, and often, and we'll look at some examples. The Hebrew midwives lied to protect the infant boys in Exodus chapter one. Rahab betrayed the soldiers of her own king to protect the Israelite spies in Joshua chapter two. And you'll remember in Judges, Jael pretends to offer Sisera a safe tent while intending to split his skull with a tent peg. That's in Judges chapter four. That's three examples right there. Clearly, they lied. The Hebrew midwives lied to protect the children because Pharaoh had told her that they were to kill them, drown them, and they lied. Oh, they were born before we got there. Rahab had Israelite spies in her midst. Was they were spying out Jericho for the coming battle. She hid them in a roof under sheaves and she told the king's soldiers who found out that they were there, the Israelite spies were there. No, 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 they're not here, but I, I think they've gone down this other road and so on and so forth. Remember, she made a deal with them. I'll hide you, spare my family, because I know, I know you're God. I know God is God. Spare my family. And they said, all right, we'll do that. You, you hide us and we'll spare you. And that's the way it worked out. She saved her family. Jael pretends to offer 
Sisera, a safe tent, the king that they were battling with. Remember Deborah and Barak were fighting him, and he hid. And, and because he came near jail, she pretended. She said, hey, come here. This is safe. He went to sleep, and she took a tent peg, and she split his skull with it. Does this mean it's okay? How many of you have uh, had someone, especially when you're witnessing, tell you, you're not supposed to lie? Okay, let me throw an example at you. Uh, you've got uh, 12 Jews. Uh, they're in your basement, and Nazis come knock on your door. You're going to lie to them that the Jews are there? Yeah. I'm going to lie to them that the Jews are there. Let's take a look at this a little closer. These deceptions are considered blameless. They all take place in wartime, and they usually protect innocent life. In essence, they reflect God's justice. Lying isn't condoned. It's the heart that they have. They didn't do this for their own self-gain. They did it to save life. So don't, don't let those questions throw you. They reflect God's justice. God in no way condones lying, but he understands the heart you see, it's the heart. It all, it all comes from here. Where is our heart? Where is our heart in this? That's what we're going to be judged on. Like the others, the ninth commandment is about Jesus, the true and faithful witness. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came to witness in truth, in total truth, to glorify the Father, to expose his Father in truth, and nothing but the truth. It's basic. It's absolutely basic. And yet it's the one, one commandment that we toss away so casually. We can go on and on and on. Again, read these scriptures for yourself. Go deeper into this, and you will see time after time after time after time. And you'll be basically be be refreshed that our God is a God of truth, thankful that our God is a God of truth, and we are to be his witnesses, and we can't be his witnesses if we're bearing that witness falsely. It has to be integral to us, basic to us, and again, that doesn't mean that we have to be unkind, but it does mean that we speak truth. Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. This one, this one's a rough one. Because it goes right to the heart. Right to the heart right to who we are. Because we have to look at what coveting is. But let's look at some scripture first. Deuteronomy 5, 21. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now let me point out that the commandment itself reads... In Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not desire your neighbor's wife, or you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, etc. So house comes first, 
and then wife. And yet in Deuteronomy, it switched. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife and then house. The wife is elevated. The bride is elevated. Just as when Jesus came, the bride is elevated. When Jesus comes, the bride is elevated. The houses are not going to stand. It's the bride. I found that interesting. In Hebrew, covet is the word hamad. It means to desire, to crave, to want, to long for, to thirst, to thirst for, to yearn for, to lust after. Coveting is a neutral word. That is, coveting can be good as well as bad, legitimate as well as illegitimate. There are certain things that it's all right for us to cover. But let's look at what covetousness is. It's a major desire, a thought. A desire, a thought that craves, lusts, and yearns. A desire, a thought that just eats away at the human heart. It is covetousness. When you covet, it's not just that you want something. You yearn for it. You desire it. You have a hunger for it. And it can enslave you. Covetousness can and often does enslave the human soul. It destroys a person or causes the destruction of other people. Covetousness is what causes and leads to so many of the other sins. A person covets a woman and commits adultery. A person covets money or property and steals or kills or defrauds. A person feels unattractive, unhealthy, inadequate, or poor, and he he or she covers what someone else has to the point of wishing that something bad would happen to that other person. A person covets recognition and acceptance or he or she seeks to escape suspicions, therefore he or she lies. You see how they all come together, they all start, you start breaking, in here you start breaking all these other commandments. You're putting something else in place of God. You're blaspheming God by wanting something bad to happen to somebody else, by wanting it so bad that you yearn for it. You're willing to do anything for it. It's not fair. Why should they have that? I want it. Hey, we all do it. We show off. We get a new car. First thing you do is you want to show it off. Look, look. remember we talked about that last week. But what happens, especially if it's a, a doozy, sometimes people see it and why is it that he has it and I don't? Why is it that they have that and I don't? I've got to get me one of those. I will do whatever. When, when I was in, in Hollywood, one of the things that you were judged by was how badly you wanted it. Did you want success above anything? Did you want success above anything or anybody? And I met my share of actors and actresses who felt exactly that way, not to mention directors, producers, people on the lot. We meet, that, we meet them today, don't we? What about power? I want power. I'll do anything for power. Our pol- whole political system almost is, is devolved into just wanting power at the cost of anything, at the cost of truth at the cost of well-being. I'd rather see the ship sink than have it in your hands. I'd rather see the country fail than than to lose power to so and so forth. History is full. It's replete of rulers that have been like that, wars that have been fought that way, begun that way, been lost that way. We've got countries built on it. I covered that territory. I need it for this. World War II, well, we need living room, living space. I need a corridor, and so I want it, so I'll take Poland. 
etc. Commandment 10 is a very, very intimate commandment. In Luke 12, 15, we're told, and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Our Lord is speaking. He's telling us, wait a minute, be careful. Watch out. Because where your heart, that's where your treasure is. Wherever you put your heart, that's your treasure. Commandment 10 concerns our security. Because we should be able to live our lives in peace and feel secure. We should not have to worry about someone coveting and stealing what we have. God wants us to feel secure and protected. God wants us to know that our wife or husband and family, our property and possessions, our joy and anything else we have is secure and protected against the covetousness and theft of people. And that's why he gives the commandment. The Bible clearly says that there is a legitimate covetousness, that God has planted within humankind certain undeniable desires, desires that we are entitled to, desires that are good. We all have legitimate desires for love, joy, peace, and legitimate desires to be secure, successful, fulfilled, and satisfied. There's nothing wrong with those. It's only when they, they take over. It's only when they take over. They become an obsession, a, a craving that will not be satisfied until you have it. In James 1.17, we're told every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we're told, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Yes, there are things we should covet. There are things, good things, that we should covet. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. In another translation, it says, Covet the best gifts. Yes, I covet the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, Lord, I covet the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, I covet your prayers. I covet your welfare. There are good things to covet. There are right ways to covet. But we've got to be careful. We've got to be very careful. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. There's the second commandment. Covetousness becomes evil when it's fixed on the wrong objects. When we miscalculate the desirability of something. Eve covets the fruit and takes it. We learn that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Shechem desires Dinah and seduces her. In Genesis 34, 2, we've learned about that. And Achan, we, we learned about him last week, covets the treasure of Jericho and steals it from God. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. These were all coveting. This is all covetousness. And our consumer culture is organized to induce desire for all the wrong things. Being attractive will bring happiness. A bigger house will make us live better. More money will bring joy into our lives. A new car is what we need to drive the blues away. What you need is to get away, go on a vacation. Who cares what it costs and how we get it? Follow your heart. Do your own thing. Just a few examples. A political commentator I came across when I was doing this study by the name of Ferdinand Mount, who's not even a believer, said the following. Covetousness has been rebranded as retail therapy. Sloth is downtime. Lust is exploring your sexuality. Anger is opening up your feelings. Vanity is looking good because you're worth it. And gluttony is the religion of foodies. 
Think about that. Romans chapter 7, verses 5 to 6. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Jesus came. Jesus came for exactly this. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 to 6, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We could have gone on and on and on. There they are, the ten words, the Decalogue. We are going to be judged by these. Yes, we are. What do we do? What do we do? How do we deal with it? What do we, how do we face this? Tune in next week. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you're not like us. We praise you. We pray that you bless and watch over us and help us to take these words to heart. Make them part of our very being. And we praise you. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your word. Where would we be without you? Oh Lord, where would we be without you? And so we pray that you bless and strengthen us this week, that you keep us in good health, that you guide our steps, and that you watch over us. That you help us to be true witnesses for you. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you all the praise and the glory. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.